Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, your leading source for insights and best practices on the digital transformation of healthcare. Join host Patty Patmanabhan, CEO of Demo Consulting and best-selling author of Healthcare Digital Transformation, how consumerism, technology, and pandemic are accelerating the future in conversation with healthcare and technology leaders. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Palbox. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. This is Patty, and it is my great privilege and honor to introduce my special guest today, John Donahue, Vice President of Applications at Penn Medicine in Philadelphia. John, great to see you. Thank you for setting aside the time, and welcome to the show. My pleasure, Patty. I've been looking forward to talking to you. And uh, before one of my peers gets upset with me, my title these days is actually Vice President of Entity Services. Okay. All right. Noted. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's jump into that then. What does that title mean in terms of the areas of responsibility for your role? Maybe just describe the applications landscape at Penn a little bit for our listeners' benefit. Sure. Yeah. So let me start, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about my background and then I'll jump into that. So I've worn many hats in the 12 years that I've been at Penn Medicine. For a long time, I was the infrastructure executive uh, responsible for enterprise infrastructure components, data centers, networks, telephony, video services, storage, et cetera. My role there was really focused around resiliency and availability, which is obviously critical in an academic health system. Several years ago, I, I took on and built the information security team. We went from about four employees to about 32 dedicated security professionals in probably less than four years. Currently wearing that hat again as we do a nationwide CISO search. However, my focus for the last couple of years has been around what we call entity services. And we refer as um, entities, hospitals, and other major functions. We've got 13 of those today, so six inpatient hospitals, several other areas like primary care physicians, specialist providers, home care, uh, school medicine, et cetera. Each of those entities has what we call an information officer, an information entity officer. And these are mini CIO types that provide support at the entity themselves. And most of these EIOs have been CIOs in smaller organizations previously. And these folks are responsible for brokering the relationship between the entity executives and corporate IT. You know, they act as an advocate for the entity. They report directly to me with a dotted line in a matrix relationship to the chief operating officer. So uh, the entity services team is comprised of about 200 people across Penn Medicine IT, delivering services like clinical engineering, platform support, network support, things like those. And they've really des been designed to allow the entities to have some autonomy when it comes to their priorities and resourcing their needs. The EIO role has been in place for about 10 years now and is part of what I think of as our special sauce of which makes our information services team um, successful. You know, having an on-site executive like that representing IS gets us a closer feel on the pulse of the entities and their business needs. It's personally brought me a little bit closer to what we do as an organization in providing world-class healthcare. So I tee it up that way, Patty, in a sense, um, you know, I've worn many of the different hats across IS over the last several years, which has given me somewhat of a unique perspective around uh, what it takes to run a, a large scale IS organization in an academic health system. Um, you asked me about applications and our, and our portfolio at, at Penn Medicine. So you know, our primary application is Epic or what we've uh, started calling Penn Chart, as we, uh, we tend to name things at Penn. You know, we started installing Epic at Penn Medicine probably 20 years ago in the ambulatory setting. About six years ago, we uh, migrated to Epic on the inpatient side of things and have since installed many other specialty modules, things like OpTime for the OR, Cupid for cardiology. Uh, we also leverage a number of their mobile platforms with tools like Haiku and Rover. Um, so Epic customers will be familiar with those terms. And we use Epic tools that allow us to work with other physician practices and hospitals, things like uh, what they call Healthy Planet, Care Everywhere, Community Connect. Uh, we also leverage some of their modules for the data analytics space, uh, tools that they call Caboodle, Clarity, Slicer, Dicer. And then lastly, we use their patient portal for facilitating communications with our patient population for things like appointment scheduling, test results, and medications. Before I start sounding too much like a commercial for Epic, um, we do leverage some other major platforms that are key to our business and clinical operations. And we're a big Cerner customer on the lab side of things, Mach 7 for imaging, and Infor for human resources and other business applications. Yeah. 
I will come back to all of this uh, because I do want to explore some of these aspects of your application landscape. Certainly, I want to talk about the information security piece of it as well. I was, I was struck by the fact that you went from a single digit number of employees to something like 35 employees. That just goes to show how important information security has become in the context of healthcare. And I think indeed in the context of all sectors, but healthcare more so. And I'd like to explore that a little bit as well. But before we dive into all that, I know that uh, you're about to launch uh, a new hospital and that has been occupying your time for uh, for a while now. And I, I have to believe that it's going to be the hospital of the future. A lot of new technology enablement aspects that uh, that are going to make uh, make for an interesting and improved experience for patients. You want to talk a little bit about that, John? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's an incredibly exciting project. It's the by far the biggest one I've ever worked on in my 35-year career. Uh, I think it's the biggest capital project in the history of Penn, which goes back about 250 plus years. Um, I can remember our first meeting on this topic over seven years ago. So it's been a long journey, but we're set up to be patient ready by the October, November timeframe this year. So it's in our West Philadelphia campus across the street from the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, The new building, it's a $1.5 billion investment that includes about 1.5 million square feet, 500 state-of-the-art private patient rooms, 47 state-of-the-art operating rooms in this 17-floor facility. And really, the innovative hospital facility is designed to support our world-class researchers, clinicians, and faculty. And that's what it's all about, is trying to create a stage for these world-class folks to do what they do best. From an IT perspective, we really viewed this as an opportunity to significantly improve the way that both our patients and our providers engage with technology. You know, much of our facility, particularly in West Philadelphia, has been old buildings. So this is a greenfield type of approach. Uh, We've designed the building to support a full digital experience with Wi-Fi and cellular coverage throughout the facility. Uh, We've developed what we call the patient footwall, which has really been around designing the integration of a number of different technologies that will make the patient stay more comfortable. These same technologies are enabled so the providers can engage with the patients during their stay. So it's somewhat innovative for us. Some examples include um, being 5G ready day one, you know, aggregating nurse call and nursing alerts to a mobile app to reduce nursing fatigue. Um, at the center of this footwall is a 75-inch TV that's a uh, you know, centerpiece for education and entertainment for the patient. You know, a tablet in the room that allows patients to manage the room, the temperature, the shades for lighting, noise levels, privacy, uh, glass, potentially ordering, you know, dietary requirements, full integration with our electronic health records. So the ability to present that on the technology that's in the room, Um, staff identification on the big screen TV. So as staff enters the room, the patients know who they are, what their role is, and potentially why they're there to, um, to talk with or treat the patient and all kinds of green environmentally friendly components that um, you know, will help us be um, responsible from an environmental perspective and also reduce some costs. So the common theme for us with this uh, pavilion and the campus itself is connectivity. You know, the need to have a patient care facility like this with advanced connectivity is fairly evident, but when you think about extending this connectivity beyond just IT and creating a seamless patient experience across the campus with transitions of care, now you're talking about some game-changing improvements in patient yeah. engagement. Do you also use the, the wall, the 75-foot display that you talked about for conducting virtual visits and uh, family visits, uh, things like that? Absolutely. Yep. And with the COVID and the pandemic, things like that became much more important to us, being able to support those type of initiatives. So, yeah, absolutely built into our strategy. All right. Almost sounds like... A- high-end luxury hotel room in some ways. Was that intentional or it just turned out that way? So it it is. We're careful to use the words like luxury because at the end of the day, we're there to take care of the patients and their their needs and focus on that work. But the intent was to have a highly private facility for our patients that would be comfortable for them and their family members. But, you know, also make it a good experience and have the room outfitted in a way that you know, it does feel like a, an improved patient experience and some place where, you know, again, our people can be comfortable while they're dealing with some of the aspects of their patient care. Our intent to provide a hospitality-like experience was, uh, was evident early on. We talked to Disney and others about things like that so that we could work them into our design. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, you must have gone through some kind of a 
a design process to really design the experience carefully. The tech, you know, tech can do everything you want it to do, but developing this uh, unique and differentiated experience requires a whole different level of understanding of human needs, I guess, right? Oh, absolutely. We did some really slick things. Um, so we obviously brought in some subject matter experts from architecture and design from across the globe, literally across the globe. And then when we thought we had it right, we built out a half a floor in a warehouse out of styrofoam and brought in time and motion studies and, and made some significant changes to our original design based on actual people, you know, wheeling gurneys through these uh, styrofoam hallways and, and looking at access and looking at traffic patterns and doing all kinds of timing exercises of how long it would take to get somebody from the ED to a, an OR and things like that. So to your point, um, as fun as the technology was, you know, that stuff typically, if you design it and implement it right, it's right. Getting it right from a design perspective is a whole other level. And, and I think we knocked it out of the park. How long did it take you to, to design the, the patient room of the future? Well, I would say from start to finish, probably three and a half to four years. And, wow. and that's, that's literally starting from scratch several times where we thought we could do it better. We found some pretty slick ways of a nurse sitting at a, a desk outside of the patient room. We've mirrored the patient room such that a nurse could actually monitor two patients at the same time through these windows. So we've done some really innovative things. The design of the, you know, the bathroom and the shower and, and how we brought those in as units and just leveraging, you know, the, the views of the city that we have. It was a pretty extensive design process. We've also designed flexibilities into the room such that the rooms could be used for many different purposes. So in the old days, you had, um, you know, sort of your normal patient care rooms and then you had specialty rooms. These rooms are all designed with, you know, booms to move patients and capabilities that they can become more, um, you know, specialized on, uh, on the change of a dime. Yeah. How many rooms do you have on, on the campus that are, that are designed and set up this way? So there's five, over 500 in this net new building. Okay. Awesome. Let's talk about a couple of other things that I really want to try and uh, get into as a part of this conversation. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is when you designed this futuristic hospital with a highly interconnected set of hardware, software, and services. Obviously, one of the foremost concerns in your mind has to be security. How do you ensure that you have network security, data security, uh, patient privacy, and so on? What additional considerations went into this when you were putting this, uh, putting the design together? Yeah, it's a great question. So if you think about this patient room, many, many components in there are what I would think of as the, the Internet of Things. So whether it's the lights or the, the devices in the room that are more typical Internet of Things type devices, everything that sits on a network poses a potential concern. So we teamed up with a number of subject matter expert partners, I'll call them, we set up a lab environment and um, we implemented all this technology in the lab. And you know, if you walked into this lab, it would almost look like the patient room to you. You know, we rolled in beds, we rolled in the monitoring equipment and everything else such that it was really a good mirror of what would have actually be happening in the new pavilion itself. And then we set to making sure that we had the security that we were looking for in that room. And we, you know, did some exercises to try to um, tap into the network through some of these devices uh, we asked our vendors to work in their labs at their own manufacturing plants. So we have a high degree of confidence right now that with the technology that we've integrated, as well as some of the standard tools we put in place to manage security across the enterprise, we're in pretty good shape. But as you know, talking to folks in this business, you need to be vigilant. The threat landscape changes dramatically over time. You talked about it earlier, you know, healthcare organizations have really become the focus of cyber attacks you know, over the last several years. And, and if you see the notifications in the media, you can see the shift there. And that started with, you know, medical records being more valuable to criminals than credit cards and right. um, has only been exacerbated with organizations like ourselves that are in the center of COVID research and vaccine distribution. But it's really important to us patient privacy and ensuring that, um, you know, we're a secure organization. So we've redoubled our efforts with this new facility to make sure that we're in good shape. Things like network segmentation, network access controls, building profiles of the way that these devices actually behave such that if they change their behavior, we have a chance to isolate them and pull them off the network, assuming for the moment that they could have been hacked or breached and could be a vulnerability. 
So we're working overtime to make sure that the, the new pavilion, as well as our the rest of our enterprise, is secure. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Powbox. So let's talk about the other side of it, which is uh, now you have a ton of data that's going to be available to you just by observing the way these devices and the software and the services are used by patients or by caregivers and uh, how the devices interact with one another, not just talking from a security standpoint, but just purely from the standpoint of improving the experience improving care outcomes, intervening at the right times, and so on. So you talk a little bit about how you've laid a data and analytics layer on top of this infrastructure that you've just described. Yeah, it's a great question as well. And, you know, so we started making investments in our data analytics group probably the last two and a half, three years, and have continued to make those investments. And now the exciting part for us is that, to your point, we're going to have all this additional information. And how do we turn that into knowledge? How do we turn that into stuff that or data that people can make information and decisions upon. So we've matured our efforts on the data analytics side. We're still, you know, I would say um, wrestling is not the right word, but we're still trying to identify the best way to use all this data because now we've got much more data than we ever had before. So we're excited by the opportunities and um, really looking at how we can make future investments in this informatics to make sure we're leveraging what we're learning through all this information. And we think to some degree we're going to be on the forefront of that. It's an area where we don't think a lot of people out there today are doing it in a live situation. So in some ways, we're going to be not developing on the fly, but, you know, sort of working through this data and and making sure our clinicians and some of our executives are aware of what's available. And then, again, optimizing based on that information. Now, are you leveraging the cloud in any significant way, either for hosting your applications infrastructure for, especially for, for this new facility and even more specifically for the data? That's a good question. So, you know, I tend to describe our cloud strategy as what I call opportunistic. So we don't like to necessarily, you know, be bleeding edge. I think from a Gartner perspective, we're, we're what they call fast followers. So we tend to let others skin their knees. That's true of healthcare not that, in general. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I think healthcare in general, and we, we tend to follow that. So not that cloud technology is new by any stretch, but, you know, we need to make sure that we had business associate agreements in place with the cloud vendors. We spent a significant amount of time building out our private cloud capabilities using hyper-converged capabilities. And we've really seen some great efficiencies there and been able to move a significant amount of our workload from different vendors and different storage and platforms that are computing. So focus early days for us has been on the, um, the hyper-converged private cloud We've also been leveraging SaaS applications wherever possible. So many of our applications that we uh, do these days are cloud-based, in addition to things like Office 365 and um, large, what I think of as infrastructure applications. We've made some investments there. But we know that in a long-term perspective, we need to leverage private clouds, public clouds, hybrid clouds, such that you know at any time of the day, we can move our enterprise workload to the least cost most secure environment. So we continue to work with the Azures and um, you know the Googles and, and others out there to make sure that we've got the right agreements in place. We've got a rather large um, high-performance computing that's used on the research and school of medicine side that we're looking to uh, you know move to a cloud environment. So again, Patty, I, I call it opportunistic. I, I don't think we drive things to the cloud just to drive things to the cloud. Right. We do it when technology is at the end of its life or there's an opportunity to be more efficient. I would say today we probably have close to 85% of our workload in some type of a cloud environment. That's a pretty high percentage uh, if you look at the landscape of healthcare enterprises. So obviously over time, you've kind of moved a significant amount of enterprise workloads to the cloud. A lot of the newer workloads, especially related to high performance computing or high volumes of data for analytics and so on and so forth, maybe the cloud is a more logical choice as well. So I guess you look at everything on a case-by-case basis, and it's not a default decision to just drop something into the cloud just because that is where you want it all to be in future. How do you do the trade-offs? I think we look at the workload itself and look at what kind of data is on those workloads, and we look at what we're doing today. So if it's um, in a 
hosted environment that we've outsourced, what's the cost of that environment? What are the pros and cons of running it in that environment? Speed to market, the way they secure their environment. So we, you know, look at it from a cost benefit standpoint and start to say, all right, what are the things that would make us more, you know, responsive, more agile to, you know, get things time to market? And what are ways that we can take our resources and focus them where we want them to be focused versus running our own data centers and setting up servers and managing the servers and storage? I think we look really at return on investment and look at, um, you know, risks. Yeah, well, you mentioned ROI, and uh, I've heard often that uh, moving things to the cloud may end up actually costing you more if you're not careful. So you care to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think we found the same thing, particularly with our high-performance computing capabilities. It looked attractive on the surface, but the devil's in the details. And once you start to say, you know, if we're going to pick this up and move it over, you learn quickly that there's some hidden costs and, and it can cost you more. Now, there are times where you'll accept those costs because it reduces investments elsewhere, or reduces, you know, resources that you need in other places. But your point's a good one. We, we've learned the hard way that sometimes the cloud is actually more expensive. Yeah. As somebody who's in charge of uh, all of the uh, applications, obviously one of the big questions that uh, you face is interoperability between the applications, right? And this has been a work in progress for healthcare in general. How would you describe the state of the union as it relates to interoperability across all of your applications in your landscape? Yeah, so it's interesting. We have taken what I'll call a 3C approach to applications. And, you know, it's one of the mantras we use in IS, the three Cs, and it's really been key to our success over time. And what that stands for is common systems centrally managed and collaboratively implemented. So as such, we've spent the bulk of the last 10 years migrating many, many small applications into these large suites that I talked about earlier, like Epic, for example. So it's allowed us to be really efficient in terms of our spend and resources and allowed us to drive a lot of cost out of the system. So as we look at integration or operability with new applications, we lean on those standard systems first and say, why not? Why can't they work for us versus adding in a new best of breed type application? Secondly, the, the second C there is the centrally managed. So pulling everybody together into a corporate IT organization has allowed us to eliminate most of the shadow IT that exists in some organizations. And we find that those shadow IT resources are the ones that in many cases introduce new applications that are hard to integrate or hard to interoperate. So between those two things, we've been able to build a pretty effective corporate organization that is able to deliver these standard solutions, A, fairly quickly, and B, economically. And then the last C I'll just mention real quick is probably our secret sauce, and, and that stands for collaboratively implemented. And you know, we've all been in organizations where there have been IT projects, and sometimes IT projects fail, and they point the finger at the CIO and say, look, it's you guys stink. We collaboratively implement, which means we really don't have IT projects. We have business projects that involve technology. And what that means is that both IT and the operational folks are at the table with skin in the game. And this has really delivered very good results for us because as things start to go wrong, we lean heavily on each other to make sure that we get good results and, and that's worked. So that strategy has really helped us in terms of eliminating overhead, but also eliminating the need to integrate and interoperate platforms that may be a challenge. Yeah. So I'm not yeah. sure if that answers your question, but that's... That's the way we've approached that. Yeah, it does. And I'd just like to ask you one follow-up question on that, because now uh, with digital transformation being a high priority area for all health systems, you find that a lot of the new innovative capabilities that you need to deliver a better experience or for improved outcomes or better collaboration among caregivers and so on, you may have to sometimes look beyond your core platform, such as your core EHR platform, to get the sort of innovation that you're looking for to drive the organization forward. So you have a little bit of a tension here, I guess. On the one hand, you're trying to consolidate all the applications into a few core platforms. But on the other hand, you also have to be open to the idea of bringing on new innovative solutions, which in many cases may be very young companies with a risk profile that's, that you're usually not used to. How do you manage this, this tension, if you will? Yeah, that's a, it's a daily tension, I would add. And you're, you're spot on with your comment there. You know, again, I'll, I'll talk about Gartner. Gartner uses a term called bimodal, and, and I interpret that to mean a dual mindset around IT. So on one hand, you have to you know, keep your network and clinical systems up and running 24 by 7, and that requires a certain strategy, mindset, and skill set. 
I think of that as making the trains hit the station every day. It's not an easy job, but getting them there on time takes yeah. some work and some focus. But at the same time, you have to have an innovative mindset to stay ahead and leverage these new capabilities. And that requires a whole different strategy, mindset, and skill sets. And leading teams that are responsible for both can be a challenge today. We feel like with innovation, you need to be prepared to recognize that every idea is not a great idea and failing fast if that's not going to be a winner. But you know, our environment, we're a learning organization. We see a lot of entrepreneurs on campus. They come out of Wharton. They come out of other schools that these guys are, folks are incredibly bright. We have a, a place on campus that's called Penovations, and it's a, a lab space. And their tagline is where ideas go to work. And this encourages people to come to Penn to do innovative work and to do emerging technology work. So we often see people knocking on our door saying, hey, we, we work for Penn or we graduated from Penn and now we're part of a startup. So we see a lot of these technologies. And, you know, I would say one out of every 10 to 12 I look at, we say, darn, this has got some real value here. A, it's addressing a pain point that we have. And, and B, it's something that we can't go to one of our established partners and say we want this capability. So we're going to have to go in an innovative way. So we've set up a new technology review board that looks at all these and, you know, uses a governance process to make sure that we're being fair and consistent. But your point is spot on. You know, not only do you need to, you know, keep your legacy applications up and running, but you need to stay focused on innovation where it can be a game changer for you as an organization. And we do that pretty well. Yeah. Well, by extension, what is the advice you have for startups anywhere across the country or even the globe that uh, have something interesting to say and, and want an audience? What's your advice for them? I think there's two things. One is um, timing. You know, I think you have to have strong technology that's almost ready for prime time. So many times people knock on our door and it's a concept. And we just don't have the cycles with everything else that we have going on to sort of work through the concept and spend those kind of cycles there. But if organizations have a, a keen eye towards making sure they do a lot of development work, they've done some market studies, they maybe even have done some work in some other organizations, timing is key. It's got to be close to being ready. And then two is I think it's finding an internal sponsor, a champion, somebody that's willing to sort of be the representative internally around that technology and speak to its benefits. You know, we talked earlier about cost benefit. You know, we're looking for return on investment. We don't mind being a partner. We don't mind helping people design functionality and capabilities. And in fact, we've done that in a handful of situations. But I think it's picking the right time to bring it to our table, not too early, not too late. And it's also really finding the sponsor, the internal person that can champion that. Yeah, that's good advice. And uh, well, we're coming up to the end of our time here. So I, I want to close this out by asking you, is there a best practice or two that you would like to share with your peers in the industry who may be listening to this podcast? And I feel like what you described about this, this new pavilion uh, is fascinating stuff. Maybe pick a best practice from there for someone who is embarking on a journey to make a billion dollar investment in a new hospital. Sure. So I think, you know, the, the best practice I would call out on the pavilion is to really engage with others. You know, sometimes you get this sense that you've got the smartest people working with you and around you and, and you try to solve problems. You know, what we learned with the pavilion was looking outward was a game changer for us. And, and I know that sounds simplistic, but We've brought to the table several technology partners. We've brought to the table several integration partners. And we've said, look, everybody's got a little bit of skin in the game here. We want you to partner with us. We want you to do some of the development on your own dime. We want you to, you know, jump when we say jump. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to be part of something pretty special and you're going to be able to talk about how you partnered with us. And again, I know that sounds simplistic, but getting the right spirit of partnership and getting the right ability to say, hey, wait a minute, let's pause and, and give these guys some time to talk about what they want to do right. It's really, again, been a game changer for us. We have one integration partner in particular, and I won't name their name, but you know, they have just been spectacular to work with. They've done some lab work in their own environment. They've tested things for us, developed documentation, and helped us figure out what it's going to take to support some of this stuff in the long run. They've um, very respectfully said, we think you've pushed the envelope too far. You need to back off a little bit. They've helped to bring others to the table. So, again, I think the best practice for us was as, as big as we are and, you know, as talented as the people that we have, both on the IT side and clinically, it helped to partner with folks that had significant resources themselves. Yeah, that's great advice. I think uh, 
partnerships, when they work, they can perform miracles for you. And we've seen this again and again. Well, John, it's been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for setting aside the time. And I look forward to following all your progress and maybe one day get to visit this new facility. I'd love to see all the cool stuff that you've implemented maybe sometime soon. Patty, it's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll give you the VIP tour when you uh, get to town. That's very kind of you. That's very kind of you. Thank you, John. Nice talking to you. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can reach us at info at thebigunlock.com with your feedback and questions. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Powbox.